Please welcome the hosts of the Healthy Dose Podcast, partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, Stephen Krauss, and founder and CEO of Oxion Partners, Trevor Price. Let's go. We, uh, this is a live recording of A Healthy Dose. I am uh, assuming that 100% of the people in the room have listened to this podcast. If not, uh, it's a bi-weekly conversation. We shoot the shit with friends and leaders in healthcare, and uh, you can find the podcast on iTunes. I think we're talking about unicorns today, right, Trevor? We are talking about unicorns. I don't know if you noticed that. Steve is always in search of unicorns yes. at Bessemer. So let's get started. Let's do it. All right, our first guest... Uh, founder and CEO of Evelyn Health, founder or actually CEO of the advisory board, and I promise you his high school daughter is the best fly fisher woman you have ever seen in your life, Frank Williams. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have the great pleasure of introducing a, a fellow brethren from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, he is one of the most successful healthcare IT entrepreneurs of all time. Jonathan Bush of Athena Health. And uh, Jonathan and Frank uh, have been podcast guests before, but our next <laughs> guest, the founder and CEO of 23andMe, a former investor and college hockey player, Ann Wojcicki. <laughs> Wojcicki. All right. Who you just met. And we'll let you touch the unicorn, too. It's good luck. <laughs> there we go. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks for being here. Um, anybody who listens to Healthy Dose knows that Trevor and I like to have a lot of fun. And uh, it's actually officially noon o'clock here in Vegas. So if we're in Vegas, uh, we've got to have some fun. And I'd like to introduce our fourth guest, uh, Julius. Julius, will you please come out? Ah. Uh. Well, Julius does have mimosas for us. He will be out here in a few seconds. But, uh, but uh, we thought we would liven it up and maybe have a, a little, little orange juice uh, today. Um, so he's coming sometime. But um, let's see. We're talking about unicorns here. And uh, I, I kid you not, it's a, it's a very popular proverb in the venture and entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem this, these days. It was coined five years ago. And I went and did some research. There's actually a global unicorn tracker uh, put out by CB Insights. And there's today 237 companies on it, um, but only seven are healthcare IT companies. And so the question I want to ask of our three illustrious panelists, all of whom run unicorn companies, who are founders of unicorn companies, and who are going to answer this question with some lubrication, um, <laughs> why don't we have more uh, unicorns well in healthcare? Thank you, Julius. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, it's hard. I mean, uh, healthcare is not an easy industry to come in as a new player. There's a lot of entrenched organizations, and in most healthcare organizations, you have to work through those organizations, not around them, because of the role of the government and um, the delivery system and physicians and all of those things. So, one, it's hard to completely go around the system. And then, two, uh, you know, what I see in a lot of startups is an idea in search of a problem, meaning I think a lot of organizations tend to start things without having a real intimate knowledge of the customer and really understanding the problem set. And, you know, you have, you know to, to, to grow to a decent size, you have to have a big idea, something that solves a problem, something that people in the healthcare system are willing to pay for. Um, and, I, I, again, I see a lot of companies that or solving something narrow, it's a great idea, but it's not really solving the customer problem, and I think that makes a big difference. Jay Bush, you were probably the first healthcare IT unicorn. What do you think? Why not more? Well, I, I feel like uh, if unicorn sort of, is that just really big, right? Really big, <laughs> mega big. Uh, so most of the capital gains in our country in the last decade have been technology companies, and most of those have been platform or network effect bearing companies of some kind. 
And that fundamentally, that network effect fundamentally requires uh, some kind of liquidity, easy of moving from one way of doing things to another. And as, as you mentioned, t uh, healthcare is highly fused together. The definitions are yeah. handed down from on high. Even the definition of an EHR, there is a committee in Washington that literally certifies you as an EHR. And what it certifies, no one would ever organically come up with. Uh, so in that illiquid setting, it's very hard to create network effect, and I think that's what you need. If you really, if you want to be a unicorn, you want to be a platform company, you've not just got to grow, but you've got to enable lots of other things to grow around you so that the ecosystem can include you, can envelop you. And Ann, you, you, uh, you obviously are our newest unicorn, um, a private unicorn, and uh, have been a long time, you know, uh, innovator, investor, executive in Silicon Valley, what's your, what's your, I mean, you're surrounded, you're like in the capital of right. unicorns. What's, what's your analysis here? <laughs> Unicorn herd. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, you, you live in the herd. <laughs> um, we run fast. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, I think it's actually a lot of what Jonathan was saying, I was just thinking about. Um, I think in part, a lot of the regulation, um, it's hard to do anything in healthcare. Yeah, I mean, just look definitely. at what happened to us. You know, it's, you know, to go through FDA process and to raise that kind of cap, like, it's super, it's yeah. hard and it's slow. And I think about, um, you know, there's like, again, reimbursement, all the legislation, it's regulated, um, the risks that come with it. And I think all of that really impedes, you know, what you said, like the connectivity. And, you know, there's not, you know, in some ways technology, like the, it, the, the unicorns that started came in part because there was this sort of freedom to operate in, you know, with, it wasn't as regulated, they sort of self-defined, but there's also information. Um, you know, we can't, it's, it's what I said a little bit on the other panel, like it's hard to get your record, it's hard to get a lot of information in healthcare. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of it, people are frankly, in my mind, like a lot of the tech companies are, are scared away. And I think there is also this issue that a lot of people in tech don't understand healthcare and a lot of people in healthcare don't understand tech. And you know, like blockchain That's changing, is, that's changing to be it, fair, it, I think. I think it's changed I, slowly. Hopefully, slowly. <laughs> right. It, it better be um, changing. Healthcare, healthcare generally, some of the big companies are B2B businesses or B2B2C. You've built a direct-to-consumer business right. for the most part. That has incremental challenges in healthcare. We haven't seen that happen. Right. I mean, in part, the re part of the reason why we're also direct-to-consumer, I mean, most other, you know, when I look at a lot of other companies out there and you talk about, oh, you know, we have 100,000 patients doing this or, you know, no one in tech talks about like 100,000 anything. Like, you know, we talk about like Facebook has like their billions and like you want millions and millions. And so 23andMe now has over 5 million people, um, you know, 85% are consented for research and have their genetic information. We have the largest genetic database in the world for research. Um, and so I think that's one thing like we're trying in some ways, like you need these big platforms with a lot of information to make some of these meaningful changes. Yeah. I, 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 it's a big deal. Getting to the game stakes level of size to where yeah. network effect right. is possible, you know, w when networks are almost impossible to enable, um, yeah. because, I mean, that's hard anywhere to get to that escape velocity. But you add the fact that you basically have to run two companies. Mm -hmm. You have to run the one that the apparatchiks have given you. Right? You must have the 300 quality measures and you must obey the 1800 pages of meaningful use and you must go pray at the FDA yeah. temple in a certain way at a certain you know, time right. of the day and you know, with the correct yeah. gesticulations. <laughs> uh, but then you must also yes. on top of that yeah. create something that is unique. Yeah. So you must be yeah. a really. good commoditized neutered nothing yeah so that you can earn the right and get to a certain size yeah. of that so that you can earn the right to be an individual, unique thing. Yeah. You see why we have them on this panel. <laughs> ah, wonderful. So uh, we want to do a couple lightning round questions. Um, first one, if you, sitting here today, name one private company that you think will be the next unicorn in healthcare. I'm going to take out my notes. This is due diligence for oh, me wow. as a venture investor. Well, I don't know about unicorn, but I do love the precision medicine space. Uh, it solves big problems, uh, and it, it, it fits with where, where we're going. And so uh, I'll be uh, a little partial to a company I'm on the board of, PsyOps, run by my friend Ken Tarkov in the oncology space, I think could have a dramatic impact across the next couple of years. And what do you think? Uh, I'm, so this is more my hope. I'm hopeful, you know, and again, I was just in in the bathroom, they have the 98.6, you know, those ads, <laughs> at least in the women's bathroom, there's 98.6 ads everywhere. Um, 
I'm hopeful that there is going to really be AI or chatbots or something for um, you know being able to get real-time healthcare input. Is it coaching or is it you know physician input? So my hope here is that you're going to really have again direct to consumer services of some sorts where easy access to information and care. Um, so I'll add two categories and then make up names that might be right. Uh, you know, one is um, what I would call the edge case. So the, the place where the tectonic plates of individuation are most fused together is underneath the umbrella of third party reimbursement, right? You take the money, yep. you smoosh it around, and then you sort of say, here, now you can have everything based on a set of rules that you don't understand. So sitting just outside of that, where, where you can monetize the money from the inside, but uh, play you know, outside of that rule in, in more of a consumer-directed way. Um, so all the companies uh, like Devoted uh, and others that sit around the edge, uh, maybe they play inside, but most of their work is outside the third-party reimbursed realm, I think is really exciting. Uh, and the other one is to take on um, the bloat that is accumulated but the, with the wonder and, and important contributions of the big dumb drug, partly with smart little drugs, but partly with just behavior. So I, I'm really interested in pair therapeutic to the Fay. Yeah. Uh, taught me about the idea of really studying what works as you get the kind of data that we have in Athena and that's 105 million charts and what is it 13% of all visits to the doctor you can start following the Hardy Boys and find out if they made it so if if they make it better back home sooner on an app than they did on a drug that's a really powerful yeah, I, I, I agree we, we think digital therapeutics are super yeah. interesting in the next phase totally hey so we just talked about this is hard and uh, for entrepreneurs in the room who aspire to build unicorns, there has to have been a point in time for each of you when you went home one night and you looked yourself in the mirror and said, I'm failing. I'm failing in this job as the CEO of this company. I don't think I can get it to where it needs to go. Do you guys remember a point in time where that happened? And then maybe even more for the entrepreneurs in the room, like how'd you wake up the next day and go to work and, and rally out of it? I mean, all we do, all of us, is fail, I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then we die, so <laughs> it, it, it's really about the creative work you take to each next attempt, right? I mean, it's... Exactly right. So, it's, I think yeah. it's a false, it's a great question, you have a great podcast and you're a beautiful man, but, <laughs> but I think it's a false question. But what is it yeah, about I mean, you that you get up every day? No, well, that I is think the creative work of the day is all the failures of yesterday that you wish you did differently and all the opportunities if you had done it differently. And it's fun to problem solve. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that's, like, people always asked about the FDA, like, what did you do right there? Yeah. I was like, all we did, like, I, I sat in my room, I called lawyers, I was just, it was problem solving. So, I mean, I think you're, like, right, like, you, you wake, it's, uh, every day is, like, not perfect, like, every day is a challenge. Yeah. Um, but the fun of it is that, like, it can always get better. And I think there's a perfectionist side, is like, you're just always trying, like, it's never, you're never satisfied. Well, now that's the inside. I mean, it, it is rare that I see a great entrepreneur who the original idea they started with is the idea. Yeah. What they're brilliant at is decreasing signal to noise. So every interaction they have with a potential customer, they are factoring that in, learning every day, iterating, trying again, and they iterate really fast and with an aspiration towards being the market leader, so they're moving at pace. And that's how you build a great business. It's rarely the original idea. And so, yes, so many hard moments that we still have today. We run into, in any business, you run into roadblocks every day and you pull your hair out. And as Ann suggested, you, you come back the next morning and, and fight again. I mean, that's so, I, so I'm going to ask the opposite question. And I've asked this of a lot of successful entrepreneurs. So please don't tell me you haven't made it yet. Because I think everybody in this room, including Trevor and I, would agree that you guys have made it. So. In the opposite realm, clearly at some point, there was a moment where you knew your company was going to work. Can you take me back to that moment? Let it, and you must remember when it was, where it was, what you thought. You, you just You're gonna did shut the same me down. thing that he did, but on the other end. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's our no job. Journey. It's like you get there or you fail. No, you always fail and you're always there. Dumb question. I don't think yeah. it's a great question. Dumb question. I, I mean, you're great, but... <laughs> 
but I, but I think I don't uh, think ever at Athena anyone. I, I just failed that. I, I just failed that like podcast Athena. question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I think if you go back, I mean, one, it was when Trevor took us on as a client. He was willing to work with us. It was uh, that was the um, point? Yeah, exactly. Um, but but in all honesty, I mean, I think if you go back to early early days, the first time someone gives you a check to do something, uh -huh. and and you know just there that, are dopamine moments. Dopamine yes, moments. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I mean, let's. I mean, that the idea that someone is actually really willing to pay you for it, and there's no better feeling in an entrepreneurial business literally when the check arrives and you get it and you can't believe it, and then you get to start out and do something. And, um, yeah. you know, I agree with Jonathan. This is, I, I'm always bothered. I, I don't like the unicorn conversation or the IPO conversation because there's such a larger aspiration for why great companies get started and what they want to achieve. And so none of us, hopefully none of us, do feel like we've made it because this is an ongoing battle to really make a difference in the areas that we're all working in. And so I, I don't walk around going, I've made it, and I doubt do you, you too. Do you walk around with the fear of failure? Like, is that is that a driving force for you as entrepreneurs? No, not for me. I've never been driven by, by fear of failure. No. I have been driven by wanting to build something great and to over deliver on the expectations we set for employees, customers, for shareholders. Um, never hype the business and what we're doing, but to really deliver and build something that's truly unique. I'm yeah. more motivated by that than failure. I, I feel like I, I don't, I, not the fear of failure thing. I, I've been so rehearsed at the art of failure, but I think, I, and, I, and I think this is not said much in our current conversation, I am motivated by uh, shame of past mistakes made again. So one of the things that happens is you make a mistake and then you make it again, and then I feel really ashamed when I let people down that I didn't learn from that quick enough, wasn't precise enough, because, uh, well, I don't know why, you know, mom and dad probably, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's useful. I think this idea that people shouldn't feel pain, shouldn't feel shame is false. I think shame, when, when you get to be accountable to other people, which is an incredible, just a really wonderful it experience does. of humanity, um, if you don't feel shame when you let them down more than once on the same theme, you're missing out on a really important developmental angle. And yeah, your microphone, ah. you might want to... <laughs> Your mic, your mic, we can't hear your you. Your mic. Speaking you can't hear me? Mic. That's yeah. very rare. Okay, write that down. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you I think, th Ann? I think for me it's not, um, you know, there's a cost, there's, there's missed opportunities. So I think what keeps me up, always, like, there's all, it's not the feel of fear of failure as much as, like, we made wrong decisions. Like, I think right now um, we have real momentum and we have real growth opportunities. Um, so it's a lot about making sure that we don't miss that opportunity. And, you know, it's ours, you know, we, we say all the time, like, it's, our, it's, ours, it's ours to lose. So, like, making sure that you make those right decisions. And I think, again, to your point, like, we're all here because we wanted to have a positive impact. Um, so, there's a, like, in my mind, like, there's a real opportunity that we're going to change healthcare meaningfully and meaningful, meaningfully change it for the experience for the consumer. And so, I want to make sure, like, I worry about my decisions, making sure that we you know, take enough risk that we make the right kinds of decisions. And I think the number one lesson I always push on, on, on entrepreneurs, in some ways, not to be afraid of failure at all, because you just have to learn to, like, take risk and then recognize when you made a mistake and then change that. But you're constantly making mistakes. Like, we make mistakes all the time. But as a culture, like, it's really important in the, in the cu culture of the company to make sure that people recognize mistakes are fine. What you have to really learn how to do is to correct when you made a mistake. So a little sensitive um, about asking more questions about unicorns. Well, I, I got one. I, 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 I know. Frank, I'm sorry. I think there is a useful definition. I, 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 I just think when I think of a unicorn, it's not that it's big or that it gets somewhere, but that it actually taps into the potential of the network. That actually, and in healthcare, with these fused tectonic plates, the opportunity to open up many other, I mean, 23 me is a great business in a lot of great ways, but it also opens up reams upon reams of new businesses and new approaches to care eventually right. yeah. as the agile you know skateboard turns into a rocket ship but, but you guys Athena should be the, hopefully will you know lord willing do the same thing and that enables other companies and that's a special moment you, you guys are being very humble up here but there's seven of you 
Right. There's like, so the three of you, and I don't think of We've the We've got like 50% market share here. Yeah and, yeah, and and you guys all founded your companies and led through that, 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 that accomplishment. So there has to be something that, and I'm going to pull back to Jamillion, like, come on, give us some insight into what that took. Like, how did you keep your employees engaged and focused on the big picture versus the, you know, because this unicorn status is something particularly probably for, for, for Ann in San Francisco is a big deal. So how do you do that? How do you lead through that? I mean, for us, it's people join the company because of the mission. You know, people want to, people want a good salary. They want to know, you know, they want to have a sustainable life. But ultimately, I think people want to know that they're doing something that makes a difference. And so when we get our BRCA approval and we have, you know, customers doing testimonials about how we saved their life, like, you know, it, it's a rewarding job. So I think that's how, like, we, in, even in the dark days of, of, you know, FDA, people, you know, one of the employees who's still at the company is like, I, I met 23andMe because if we don't do this, no one else will. And so people really feel that sense of pride and mission. And I think one of the most important things is like that team, like that team mentality, like you're, in, you're all in it together and we're out there for change and like in showing people like, wow, like we actually really are having an impact. And that's the beauty for us of being direct to consumer is like we hear, we hear a lot from our customers um, and we see what the impact of our work is. So that I think drives people, you know, to, to come to work every day. We have an incredible retention rate. So I'm so going to ask Frank. Frank, I, I was I was fortunate enough to sit with your team in the weeks leading up to your IPO, and you and your team sat there and had a several hour discussion around what this company was and why you were there, and that this IPO, which was going to you know anoint Evelyn as one of the kind of leaders in the space, was not anything other than just capital to keep going. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. I mean, it, it's what Anne said, but. The broader aspiration, the broader mission, the values, that's what brought people to Evelyn, right? And, you know, I've been involved in public companies for 18 years, and I can rarely think of a time that I ever put the stock price up in front of anybody. Because there's lots of times where we don't control what's going on in the market, where the price is, and yet what we do control is the mission and values and how we live them every day. And, you know, Seth Blackley, Tom Peterson, my co-founders, amazing at living those values, at everyone we hire sharing them, of valuing people and giving them incredible, extraordinary experiences in their work. And you're gonna go through tons of ups and downs. And I think the great companies are when you actually do go through a crisis and you see people locked in and more fired up because they believe in the broader mission than they're watching the stock price and think it's a bad day because it went down two points. And it's such an incredibly important thing that I see so many people celebrating these fundraising moments, these mo you know things that don't mean a lot to the average employee, and I think it's ultimately what makes the DNA of great companies. So um, we've had a lot of successes in our industry. We've, we've also had some uh, number of failures. That unicorn list now is seven. It used to be 11. In the past 18 months, we've had Theranos, obviously very publicly, Zenefits, Nant Health, Outcome Health. So unicorns can fly, they can also fall. W what do we make of this? What do we make of these? Uh... <laughs> flying, sorry, I'm stuck on the flying unit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, look, from afar, I'm not deep on the companies or the situations, but um, from afar, um, I think sometimes uh, humility uh, is a great way to start a business and a great way to build it, and when you get out way too in, in front of your ski tips, uh, you know, a lot of people want to bring you down. Um, I'm not a big fan of CEOs who make the company about them and just them um, personally, and I think you do see that a little bit in some of those instances. And look, if, you know, I learned this a long time ago, an old CFO, Leanne Zumwalt, who I worked with, always had said the highest valuation isn't the best valuation. And I didn't understand it when she told me, and then after years of being in, in uh, public company land, I really understand it, which is, look, you've got to set expectations at a level that you can meet them. And if you stretch the expectation too high, then you begin chasing things, the way you operate the company, the growth things you pursue, all in chasing this big, hype vision, and you make a lot of mistakes, and in some cases, maybe you stretch the bounds uh, you know, what you should be doing or not. And it's not a statement against any of those founders because I don't know them or their situation well, but it's just a general comment. I think that's a big yeah. vulnerability is 
especially as things starts to work, the, the value of precision goes up and up and up. Initially, you need, as you said, a really beautiful grand idea that just this thing could be 100 times bigger than what we have and have consequences that are bigger beyond that. And then you said, and then when it starts to work, you have to build a culture where that ownership is spread broad-based and where people have the real tools, resources, and latitude that they need. Uh, and then I think, I'm taking yours because I need one, precise evaluation of those opportunities because that ball gets rolling yeah. and suddenly you have a real kind of engineering level challenge to make sure that you take on the right depth and breadth of each new, you actually have a crisis of overwhelming opportunity and the degree to which you can be precise and relentless uh, to push these new fledgling things into your big base, uh, I think is the degree to which you get to keep, keep doing it, keep creating new frontiers. I want to just, I just want to, and, and to your point on self-reflection, you know, are you willing to admit when something isn't working? Yeah. Right? Which a lot of people just keep plugging this, you know, and just being really honest, you know, look, if we don't do this by X date, this, we're not doing this anymore. Right. I think one other thing just on that, like healthcare is full of hype. Like I always say, yes. healthcare is the original mm -hmm. fake news. Yeah. And oh. it's, <laughs> wow. it's, but it is. Quality like, measures you, are the look, original. If you look at like, <laughs> if you look at healthcare advertising in the twenties, like you, you could sell anything for like any kind of disease. So I think the reality is you have a lot of really unsophisticated investors who like they say like, you know, I, you know, friends I know, they're like, oh, but they're trying to cure cancer. Yeah, people fall in love. And really they easy. fall in love yeah. and no one feels good shorting like, oh, but they're trying to like cure cancer. Yeah. It's, so the it's reality, our new like, alchemy, right? Oh, we're gonna, yeah. you know, so I don't know what they're doing in there. So a lot of people can sell a grand idea yeah. and it can take a while before it really collapses. And so, I mean, one of the things I always look for is like, you want a balance of like investors who actually Really know what they're doing. You want to know that there's not, like I always said my rules when I was investing, it was like, you know, two Nobel laureates and, you know, like too many private investors, like, is a red flag for, like, it's a, it looks shiny, <laughs> but it's not real. Yeah. Yes, totally agree. And can I add, I think we missed an important fake unicorn uh, or whatever we want to call it. Um, we have one of the many blessings of this market that we're in is our ability to form capital is extraordinary we can form really large amounts of capital. So we can sort of stuff an idea that isn't actually yet tracking and building and scrapping and delivering its own oxygen with like a foie gras goose full of cash and, and allow it to run too long yeah. and, and, and too big too soon. We've seen a lot, there are others uh, that's the new. That's a new unicorn, a foie gras goose. <laughs> well, the, yeah. that overstuffing of cash, and really nailed it with the, you know, the, 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 the dentist and the Academy Award, you know, the Nobel the laureates, Nobel laureates on your the capital end. table. Yes. Uh, you know, I think I think the idea of a shout out to you know VCs and rounds and hurdles uh, in order to actually get legitimacy before you get cash. Right. So a uh, couple of couple of quick questions to to, to wrap up. Uh, uh, according to Warren Buffett, it's going to be a couple of months before the new CEO is announced at Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, Amazon. You guys are three of the most high profile. I'm sure you've all gotten calls on this. What would you do with that company if you ended up being company as CEO? I'm not what worried do you do with that uh, about struggling with that question. You're not going to take that one <laughs> right now? <laughs> and what do you think? Like, I... Largest self-insured employer, nonprofit do the right thing. I, I love, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is like the three together is really interesting, but that said, it's still not necessarily that many people, like again, relative to tech, like it's a million people. It's not critical mass in any area to make enough change. I, I spend my days thinking about, like I'm a, obviously a huge believer in the consumer market. Like how do you in some ways get these million people out of the existing system? Like stop using your insurance. Like go to the minute clinics out there. Actually just like use the chat bots for the doctors. Like how do you actually get those people? Because I really believe when you give people the tools, they step up and they actually want to be proactive about their health. So if I was in charge of that, I would say we're going to have a very consumer centric that uses minimal insurance and we're going to believe in these people. We yes. believe in these people that they are going to step up and they're going to try to be healthier. Yeah, and probably not investment bankers going first on the, you know, fend for yourself in the healthcare world. I mean, I really wish it was, I wish Warren Buffett had gotten, you know, all the truck detailers and, you know, gas station employees and folks that are really being crushed by $500 a month 
mm -hmm. taken from, honestly, the social determinants of health and put into comparatively useless colonoscopies or whatever else they're getting from the intervention machine, you know, those are the first people to go. Those are going to be the makers of the new manners. Yeah. And so I just worry that another leapfrog group with another set of metrics. Uh, I mean, I, I would just say healthcare continues to be a local market game with where purchasing power and local dynamics matter. And so I would start in those markets, start where Amazon is, bring together a whole bunch of other employers that have real purchasing power. And whatever the innovation is, drive the innovation through the system. They're holding the dollars. But it's not going to make a difference trying to do it with small mass in 50 markets, but do it really big in the, in the primary cities where those employers are. All right, last lightning round question. I'm going to name five companies. I know. <laughs> Google, Amazon, Apple, Walmart, Optum. Who is going to be the most impactful in healthcare in five years? And then who is going to be the most impactful in healthcare in 10 years? I'm going Apple, uh, Athena Health. Which one was Athena Health? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got Apple, Athena Health. I think he said Evelyn Health, but anyway. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go Walmart because I still think... Walmart uh, in 10 years? Uh, I'm going to go Walmart in five years. Walmart in five years. And in 10, because I still believe that healthcare needs to be delivered through people and caregivers. And while I think tech is very valuable, I'm going to go with something that's built off an existing delivery system versus pure tech. And? I know it's very controversial. I, I mean, I've never seen a company execute as well as Amazon. I just... They're, I mean, they're amazing I with their they're execution. Amazing. And so I have no idea what they will actually do, but it's whatever it is, it will be impactful. All right, well, please join us in thanking our unicorn panel, Frank, Jonathan, and Ann. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, Stephen, Ann, Frank, and Jonathan. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this morning's general session.